Hello and welcome to my talk, Structural Injustice for Ontological Individualists. I will start out by just outlining a traditional conception of uh, justice and also, of course, then how to sort of can underlie how to formulate uh, relevant principles of justice. And this one comes from uh, John Rawls and his book, uh, Theory of Justice. So before articulating his specific theory, uh, he makes certain kinds of moves in order just to sort of identify what the, what the topic is. One of them is that he identifies the primary subject of justice, and this is a quote from the book, uh, as the basic structure of society, or more exactly, the way in which the major social institutions distribute fundamental rights and duties and determine the division of advantages from social cooperation. By major institutions, I understand the political constitution and the principal economic and social arrangements. So institutions play an important part here, and we then also get a definition of what an institution is. Namely, a public system of rules, which defines offices and positions with their rights and duties, powers and immunities, and the like. These rules specify certain forms of actions as permissible, others as forbidden, and they provide for certain penalties and defenses and so on then when uh, violations occur. So justice is understood in terms of a distribution of rights and good um, across individuals, uh, the population of a specific uh, society. Um, the debate that is sort of envisaged here is one uh, about the extent of our individual liberties and the size and exact character of the welfare state. So Rawls' um, position here is very much in line with a kind of classic left-right uh, political debate or political philosophical debate. Um, and back in the uh, 1970s, when uh, Rawls wrote this, of course, someone like Robert Nozick was probably seen as a, as a sort of kind of primary contrast to, to the Rawlsian um, position. However, as we all know, um, discussions about justice and what counts as uh, injustices have uh, expanded greatly since then. And this kind of conception of what justice is about uh, might then seem, seem uh, out of date. The question is just sort of how um, great revisions do we need to make uh, in terms of the underlying ontological ideas in order to, to be able to account for maybe uh, forms of injustice that go beyond the ones that would be captured, captured by, say, a Rawlsian conception of justice. Um, some in this debate, um, for them, the answer to this question is that we do need not just a tweaking of uh, the principles of justice, but sort of a more wholesale uh, revision of the very approach to justice that uh, someone like Rawls is an example of. So for instance, Aris Marin Young in her very influential book, Justice and the Politics of Difference, she criticizes what she calls the distributive paradigm, uh, which Rawls is an example of, the prime example of. Um, um, so it neglects certain features of our societies that are very important. So one example is uh, decision-making structures and procedures. So for instance, we can talk about things like freedom of speech, but then there are also various kinds of norms and ideas governing who gets to speak uh, in practice, and maybe even more importantly, who gets to be listened uh, to. And this isn't regulated by, by, by um, uh, laws about freedom of speech. This is something much more informal. There are also questions about divisions of labor, how different kinds of labor is valued. Um, and this is, of course, a type of point that has been made repeatedly by feminist theorists uh, in relation, for instance, to how, how uh, household work um, is, is valued or, or, or not. Uh, there are also questions of culture, uh, different kinds of symbolic meanings that attach to people and to their actions, which then uh, in actual practice very much affects their social standing and the kinds of opportunities that are realistically open to them. So, so it's one example here might be, say, um, um, a woman speaks very assertively, and this is then interpreted by those surrounding her as aggressive behavior. 
uh, whereas if a man uh, spoke in the same way, it would just be seen as assertive and maybe even quite, quite proper. So the very same behavior might take on a different kind of um, different kind of meaning, depending on sort of these kinds of cultural significances that are attached to what we do. And again, these aren't anything that are regulated by, uh, by law, um, but something much more uh, diffuse uh, and arguably then difficult to capture within this kind of distributive paradigm. Now, especially this third uh, category has in recent years uh, very much been in focus of um, Sally Haslinger's influential critique of um, individualistic social ontology and also in sort of um, uh, her arguments for why uh, ideology critique uh, is, is, is a necessary component of um, uh, addressing uh, relevant uh, structural injustices characterizing uh, contemporary societies. Now, so for philosophers like Young or Haslanger, um, the, the critique here is not just about sort of some, some, some small, small um, changes that we need to be made uh, to traditional conception, but it cuts much deeper. It's about the ontological presuppositions of a more uh, traditional uh, approach. And because of those ontological presuppositions, we then, according to these kinds of arguments, we narrow down the scope of justice in a way uh, that leaves us unable to, to address uh, what really are relevant uh, social uh, injustices of the structural kind. Um, a further line of argument, uh, which has been developed by Young in her later works, um, focuses on responsibility. She there criticizes what she calls a liability model for responsibility. Now, the liability model is a backward-looking conception of responsibility, and it involves uh, three main conditions for imputing responsibility. And you have them on the, uh, on the PowerPoint. So one is, the harm in question is caused by an identifiable action by an agent. Then the agent acted voluntarily in causing the harm and the agent had sufficient knowledge of the consequences of the action. So these are required for being held responsible. Now, the problem with this kind of model, according to Young, is again that it leaves us unable to address uh, many forms of structural injustice where um, vast numbers of actors can contribute to how um, different kinds of uh, patterns come to be. So there might be harmful outcomes produced, but where, as Young puts it, many of them, um, many of the agents uh, have little awareness of how their actions contribute to, to, to the establishing of these patterns or processes. Now, um, since um, Young formulated this kind of arguments, it should be said that the implicit bias literature has added ways that still focuses on individuals, um, ways of understanding how individuals can be can be causally responsible for certain harms um, while being so unknowingly. But someone like Haslanger uh, has argued then that such accounts still do not take us far enough to account for structural injustice. So, so while um, thinking in terms of implicit bias might sort of add to, to, to the toolbox of a more kind of traditional individualistic approach, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't suffice. So uh, as can be seen here, there are two main issues. And uh, I mean, I think they are, um, they are connected to each other actually. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll be talking a bit about uh, uh, both of them. One is um, what might be called the location of wrongs. So this is about how injustices are suffered and how the relevant wrongs are to be understood. Can this be accounted for um, completely in terms of individuals or not? So the distributive paradigm is an individual account of this, where injustices can be understood in terms of distributions across individuals. The other is the location of responsibility, whether we talk about it as moral or just causal responsibility. Um, again, we have sort of a, a choice here to make between individualistic models or maybe to, to, to see uh, certain kinds of decent causal responsibility, maybe even uh, moral responsibility, um, as lying on a structural level or a group level and not be, being reducible to, to, to um, attitudes and behavior of individuals, or not fully reducible at least. The liability model, of course, is a, is a, is a typical individualistic stance in this, this, uh, this uh, issue. Now, 
For an ontological individualist, um, it is clear that individuals should be the relevant locations here, but um, we need not be sort of tied to how individualists have formulated this kind of approach in the past. So there is still some room for reconsidering uh, the details of that story. And then the question is just, how far can that kind of reconsideration of the details of story take us? Now, it should also be said that while giving up on individualism might look attractive at first sight as a simple way of um, addressing these problems, it does also come with certain risks, or at least arguably so. Um, so the strong sort of structuralist approach might risk uh, making these kinds of injustices a bit too nebulous uh, for people to relate to. And it might also leave them as um, no one's job to fix. They just sort of kind of floating about in society and no, no individual is really responsible uh, for them. Um, Robin Zheng has uh, made uh, these kinds of uh, arguments for instance, so in, in, in defending an individualistic approach. So um, what is the problem with the more traditional approach? Um, in terms of the knowledge intention parts of the liability model, I mean, they are clearly problematic. But uh, I don't think that they necessarily should be seen as sort of essential to the traditional approach. For instance, um, in law, we have standards like criminal negligence or uh, strict liability that are sometimes applied, and these don't invoke that kind of sort of um, knowledge intention uh, demand. Um, so there are there are ways in which sort of a, a more traditional approach can still integrate uh, integrate ways of thinking about uh, these things that that um, sort of still extend uh, what we are responsible for. Um, however, there are aspects of that approach that might be more uh, that might be more difficult to 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 maintain. And I think we should distinguish here between two individualistic ideas. So one is what might be called singularism. So this is that whenever an individual suffers an injustice, there must be a specific identifiable agent who has either caused it or failed to prevent it. The other is what might be called contributivism. Whenever an individual suffers an injustice, there must be a number of individuals whose attitudes and behavior together ultimately made that injustice happen or failed to take steps to prevent it. So contributivism is how Bao how, about how injustices can ultimately be explicated. Whereas singularism is much stronger thesis about really sort of locating the whole responsibility for something in a particular, particular agent. Now, I think that singularism should be rejected uh, in order to be able to account for, for structural injustices at least. Or at the very least, it is it should be clear that it is completely optional as a thesis for an ontological individualist. So, so you, don't, you don't have to be a singularist. Contributivism, however, I think should be uh, maintained. Uh, at the very least, giving up on singularism doesn't require or imply uh, having to give up on contributivism as well. But I also think that if we give up on contributivism, then we, we, we are more or less giving up on, on ontological uh, individualism. Now, the relevant contributions here can be uh, both causal uh, or um, constitutive. Okay, so an alternative explanation uh, for um, why um, traditional models often um, fail to address structural injustices might be um, actually that there is a particular form of singularism at work, and this can be clearly seen in someone like Rawls, namely statism that justice is seen as something typically promoted by government policies. And by having a certain kind of agent in mind, then that also limits the scope of what falls under uh, justice. So there are these two kind of tendencies. Though. One is legalism, to focus very much on our legal rights and duties. And again, these are sort of not, not all the kinds of rights and duties that might be relevant to our social standing and the possibilities open to us. The other is e economism, so that the relevant goods that we need for having a reasonable set of opportunities uh, are understood either as economic or as something that can be arranged through economic expenditures by the state, say education. So this limits the scope 
uh, of, uh, of justice to the kinds of things that the state can address through its typical means, such as lawmaking, taxation, and welfare programs. But these, these, do, these do not empty out uh, what we can talk about in terms of distributions. So for the individualist, um, questions of justice are about how constraints and enablements are distributed across a population of individuals. But if we abandon status and legalism and economism, we can broaden our conception of the relevant constraints and enablements. So for instance, with respect to rights, we can talk about many social norms in terms of how uh, different acts actors are enabled or constrained so that they have kind of sort of informal rights to do um, different things or informal duties that tie them in certain ways. And this is something um, that uh, I myself have, have um, sort of tried to analyze in, 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 in a couple of previous papers. In relation to resources, um, we can talk about other resources and economic resources. So we can talk about cultural and conceptual resources for self-understanding and for understanding others. Um, and these can, uh, again, enable or constrain people in their uh, effective, uh, effective agency. So um, if I, as an agent, is very sort of limited to, uh, in terms of the kind of resources that I have for self-understanding and for kind of affirming my own agency, then that will kind of shrink the opportunities that are uh, realistically uh, available to me. And these, can, these resources can, can be interpreted in terms of uh, distributions, in terms of the kind of opportunities they afford or not to, to um, individuals. We can also talk about different kinds of risks and how they are distributed beyond sort of what is subject to legal regulations, there might be many sort of informal ways of acting that can uh, render different courses of actions more or less risky in a way that might not be sort of uh, uh, readily apparent. So, so here's an example we had earlier about a, a woman um, talking assertively. Then there is then a greater risk for that kind of action to be uh, deemed as aggressive by other people compared to how it would be uh, maybe for uh, for a man talking assertively. So these kinds of risks then, uh, they can also be seen as distributed unevenly and unjustly uh, across uh, individuals. If we then return to the question of responsibility, and as I said, these two are linked because be depending on how we think about which are the relevant agents and about responsibility, that might in itself sort of affect um, what kinds of things that might fall under um, uh, the, the, the scope of justice. Now, in order to address structural injustices, we arguably need to think of responsibility in, in, these, uh, in ways that involve at least these two uh, elements. One is to emphasize individual responsibility for small contributions. So, um, Again, if we drop statism, so the relevant distributions are not, not just put into place by the state, but often also by many small acts uh, by us as individuals, then I think we need to start seeing ourselves as contributors, I mean, maybe small time contributors, but still contributors to the maintaining of these, uh, these patterns. We also need to focus more on omissions and negligence. So taking responsibility and being a sort of social responsible agent means also taking responsibility for failures to act or acts down out of ignorance that can um, serve to uphold problematic uh, societal patterns. So here, possibly an analog to, to strict liability, uh, a strict liability standard might, might, um, might be made. So, so, so we, we, if, there is, so if, if there are certain injustices, going on in our society, then, then we, we are responsible, even if it's just sort of, we are just small time uh, contributors. So the shift needed on this kind of argument is then not, that is then a shift from just asking how I have wronged anyone, but to also act, ask which steps have I taken or not to minimize the ways in which I contribute to maintaining uh, unjust distributions of rights, resources, and risks. That's it for the talk.
thank you uh, very much for listening.